We're going to go ahead and uh, just do the welcome as folks are coming in from the plenary. I know that it was um, a little difficult to find this room. I know I stopped multiple people and said, where are we going? So as everyone's kind of filtering in, I just wanted to welcome everybody to our session, which is uh, session 10, a look at alternative medicine, fad diets, and other supplements, helpful or harmful. That's what some of our speakers are going to help us uh, figure out here. Here's just sort of, I know that looks like a really busy agenda, but it was just so that everyone would know kind of, okay, uh, this is how long uh, you have to, uh, to speak. And then we'll each, after each speaker, we'll do some questions and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about how we need to submit those here in a minute. So our first speaker will be uh, Judy Fulton, then we have Becca Summer, then we have Caitlin Kennis, and then we have Jonathan Grant. Some of our objectives for this course will be to describe the comprehensive comprehension sorry, of various diets in cystic fibrosis, explain the gold standard fad diets and the new trends that are out there and how they might apply to a CF patient. Examine and discuss the safety and efficacy of supplements. Focus on those herbal supplements that a lot of our patients are asking us about now. CBD and TSH, which I don't know about you, but there's a lot of our patients who are... Uh, heavy into that, and essential oils. And then we're also going to review the health maintenance in relation to diet and changes needed in adulthood. I just have one um, sort of announcement first. Since this is a nursing and uh, involved in here, I just wanted to make an announcement for the uh, LEAP program which is the Leadership and Education for Advanced Practice Nurses. We are um, currently finishing up the second year of the first um, pilot LEAP program, but we are going to do a LEAP 2.0. So what this is, this is a um, comprehensive curriculum on CF pediatric and adult care, including local clinical mentorship and national professional mentorship. And so to... It is a two-year postgraduate training program for novice APPs with two to four months experiencing practicing in CF. It's co-chaired by Cindy Brady, a nurse practitioner, and Dr. Jordan Dunnitz um, from Minnesota. And our pilot launched in June 2021 with 13 fellows and will conclude in May of 2023, but then we will offer LEAP 2.0. Um, starting in September 2023 through August 2025. And if you have any questions about that, um, I am happy you can email me. I'm one of the facilitators for the program or um, any of those folks that I just mentioned. And we're just going to give you a little bit of information on how you can submit your questions and uh, to us so therefore we can ask the speakers about that since we don't have any microphones out in the audience there. So on your app, some of you may have done this in other sessions already, but if you haven't, on your app, when you go to our session, um, S10, at the very bottom, you'll see a Q&A button. You can click that, and it takes you to the Q&A page. Um, and so we'll have five minutes after each presenter for questions for that presenter. And then if there's time at the end, our presenters will stay so that we can answer any questions that weren't able to be answered in that time. Um, just a note, when you do click Q&A and it opens up the screen for you, it will default to the discussion board, which we don't see up here on our iPad. So what we want to do is select the middle tab at the top that says questions and then those will come in and then to prevent duplicates what you can do is look at the questions that have already been answered or put on the board and um, vote on them so if it's something that you also want to hear about it if you select a vote it will kind of bring up the priority for us on our list here um, so thank you so our first speaker is Judy Fulton she has served as a clinical dietitian at Children's Hospital Colorado CF Center. She recently added the role of program coordinator. Judy has worked in CF nutrition for over 30 years at three different hospitals, including Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, and then her current Colorado Center. She is a CF nutrition mentor. She has been a nutrition representative for the CFF Steering Committee, Guidelines Committee, and a member of the Food Security Committee. She has presented in several local and national meetings on nutrition. Please welcome Judy. Thank you. 
So thank you again for giving me this opportunity to present debunking diets, fact or fad. Hopefully you can hear me okay. So I have no relationships to disclose. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. My educational objectives is to define the history of the CF diet and have an improved understanding of its future, identify resources for fad diets and know the diet history, mechanism of action, cautions and concerns, and improve your comprehension and understanding of fad diets to be better able to discuss with your CF patients and families and to do all of this in the next 20 minutes. So let's get started with the history of dietary management of CF. In 1938, Dorothy Anderson wrote the first medical paper related to CF. At that point, the diet was a low-fat diet that was prescribed for infants and children with CF, and growth failure was recognized, and it was considered inevitable. Um, the diet was used to control signs and symptoms of steatorrhea, and pancreatic enzymes, oral pancreatic enzymes, became available in the late 1980s. But because we had our patients on a low-fat diet, we dosed them at a low dose of lipase. So in 1988, Corey and colleagues in Canada went and did a publication where they compared the care at their Canadian CF center to the care of the patients in a CF center here in the United States. And they noted that the patients in Canada were living longer, not just a few years, but actually nine years longer survival in Canada. When they looked back at the difference in care, we realized that the Canadian patients had a higher BMI, they followed a higher fat diet, and they used more pancreatic enzymes. So that was a turning point for the diet, and we started recommending a higher fat diet, higher calorie diet, called the Legacy CF diet, with liberalized pancreatic enzymes, and this was prescribed to all our patients with CF. So then in 2012 to the present, we had the approval of Ivacaptor, the first drug to treat the underlying causes of CF in certain subgroups. We noted weight gain as a secondary outcome, which was pretty exciting. Um, additional CFTR modulators have since been approved for a larger number of individuals with CF. And overall, we saw kind of like mixed results you know, over from like 2012 to about five years ago when Trikafta came out with our adults. And that was a really, again, pivotal time where we started seeing in our adult patients and our young teenagers the ability to gain weight without trying as hard, not eating as much. And we actually started seeing some of our patients become overweight and obese. So then we started questioning the legacy diet and whether or not we should be following this in all our individuals with CF. So the next slide is, what is this legacy diet that we've been following over the last 30 years? So it's a high calorie, high fat diet. High calorie being 110 to 200% of the usual intake for age. It's a lot of calories. It's high fat, 40 to 50% of the total intake being from fat, oftentimes saturated fat. Liberal use of the salt shaker, I think you've heard that term before in your clinic. Just extra salt, not a specific amount, just shake the salt on your foods. The diet emphasis, again, is on quantity, not the quality of the calories. Like you said, I've been a dietitian for over 30 years. So I was one of those dietitians that made the transition from recommending skim milk to recommending whole milk. But we didn't stop there. We had a product called Scandi Shake. I don't know if you guys remember Scandi Shake. It's a powdered supplement that you added to whole milk. And guess what? We increased the calories up to 600 calories a serving. But we didn't stop there. 
We added ice cream, peanut butter, whipped cream, because we needed to get that milk higher in calories. So they were drinking this milkshake smoothie concoction of 1,000 calories. And the emphasis was on the quantity of calories, not the quantity. Um, the quantity of calories, not the quality of calories. So Katie McDonald um, in 2020 um, did a systematic evidence review, a beautiful review of the legacy diet and said that there was no benefit of higher fat diet in CF except for the content of achieving adequate caloric intake in a smaller volume of food. And as people are coming in, please, there's tons of seats down here, so come on in. Um, a lot of our sessions, people have been standing in the back. There's lots of room down here. So dietary guidelines for Americans. What are we supposed to be eating? And I put this slide in because I don't know what we're supposed to be eating sometimes. And so I wanted to give a little bit of the history. So back in the 1970s, Senator McGovern, and again, I remember these people, some of you never heard of them before, but he called a hearing to discuss um, doing research between diet and heart disease. This was after eight senators died from heart disease. So there was a need, there was a, a big need for the dietary guidelines. This hearing led to the publication of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. I don't know how many of you have heard of this before, but it was published in 1980. And now, every five years, the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, and the HHS, Health and Human Services, publish updated dietary guidelines every five years. The last were actually published in 2020. So guess what? We as Americans, we have guidelines for how we're supposed to be eating. So let's see how we're doing. Ten, less than 10% of our calories should be from sugar and saturated fat. Less than 2,300 milligrams from sodium a day. Limited alcoholic beverages to two drinks for males, one for females a day. According to the Health Eating Index, never knew this existed, but they show that there is only a 59% following of these recommendations. I was laughing up with my roommate, because I don't know about you, since I arrived here in Philadelphia, I have not been following these recommendations <laughs> at all. So I think it's really hard. So I'm gonna jump into some of the fad diets. And I wanted to just throw some numbers out because when I started looking at this, I realized how big of an area this is, looking at fad diets and all the different diets out there. And like I said, I now have about 15 minutes to do this talk. So um, the weight loss industry in America right now is a $60 billion industry. $60 billion a year we spend on weight loss. This is including gym memberships. This is including weight loss programs, weight loss foods, weight loss books. Guess what? If you pulled out your phone right now and you Googled, Googled Amazon and you looked up weight loss books, guess how many books are out there on Amazon on weight loss? 30,000 weight loss books. That's crazy, that's a lot of books. Meanwhile, there's just as many diets, and I just listed some of them here. And guess what, I am not an expert on all these diets, but we're gonna have fun talking about some of them. So, I decided to do a road map to help us navigate through these fad diets because I needed it. And again, I'm a dietitian. I, but I know others, when you're seeing patients in clinic, you need to have the resources too. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk about some fad diets, give you a diet history, a brief definition, talk about the mechanism of action, give you some examples, talk about some cautions and concerns, and then talk about the US News and World Report's ranking of these diets. This was really cool. I didn't realize that every year there is a group of health experts, part of the US News and World Report, they rank fad diets and they do the top 40 diets. So let's talk about number one, Mediterranean diet. Most of you have probably 
heard of the Mediterranean diet, I hope, because guess what? It's number one for the best diet in 2022 by US News Report, and it's been the number one diet for the last five years in a row. So the Mediterranean diet, the history, goes back into the 1960s, but it really gained popularity in 1984 when it made the cover of Time magazine, and it was called The War on Fat. And again, you can Google this if you want, but it was, you know, when a fat diet makes the cover of Time magazine, you know it's gonna be a popular diet. But the research goes back to Ansel Key's seven country study back in the early 60s, and he looked at the health benefits of an eating pattern at just not in, like, you think of Mediterranean, you think of Greece, but it's not just Greece. It's Italy, Spain, France. It's a whole region and how they're eating. And he noted they had lower cholesterol, less heart disease, less obesity, diabetes, cancer. So what is this mechanism of action for this diet? It's minimally processed plant-based foods, a low carbohydrate, high monounsaturated fats, olive oil, low in saturated fats, butter, and yes, there's red wine, uh, one to two glasses a day. And this is an eating pattern, not a structured diet. And it's very easy to follow this diet. When you look it up, it's an easier diet to follow. Maybe not when you're at NACFC, but overall, it's an easier diet to follow. Concerns with this diet are minimal. You may have lower um, levels of iron because sometimes you cut back on the red meats, sometimes a little lower calcium. Not everyone should drink wine. Not too many concerns. So the next diet I wanted to just talk about briefly is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension or the DASH diet. This was number two. Okay, we're doing the top diets here. Number two best diet in 2022 by US News and World Reports. Um, the dietary, the DASH diet, I'm just gonna call it the DASH diet, became popular in the early 1990s because hypertension in the United States was at 25% of the population. That was reported. I mean, like, that's a really high rate of hypertension. So they did a lot of funding of research, the government did a lot of funding of research. So the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute and the National Institute for Health both started doing research to look at how we can lower hypertension and heart disease, obesity, and diabetes in Americans. The diet looks and sounds a lot like the Mediterranean diet. It encourages lots of fruits and vegetables, high in potassium, calcium, protein, fiber, a lower fat meats, lower fat dairy. They also added in no sugar sweetened beverages, because again, this is the early 90s, so they started coming out with diet sodas. So they had the big switch from using sugared beverages to diet beverages. But the biggest change with the DASH diet, and what I like to talk about, is the fact that they limited sodium to 2,300 milligrams a day with a goal to lower it down to 1,500 milligrams a day. So remember earlier I talked about the dietary guidelines being just published in 1980? Guess what the sodium recommendations were then? 5,000 milligrams a day, a lot higher. So this DASH diet cut the sodium intake in half. And I just found that interesting. So concerns with the DASH diet is that it does require a little bit of meal planning. It's a little bit harder to follow. And some of the fruits and vegetables, again, high fruits and vegetables, could cause some bloating. Besides that, not too many concerns. Ketogenic diet. According to New US News and World Report, number 37. Again, I, I know, I jumped from one, two, and now we're at 37. Because again, now I have about 10 minutes to talk. So, number 37, best diet for 2022, US News and World Reports. I put a cup of coffee on here, and um, it looks like a very creamy cup of coffee, because this is my 
image of my first exposure to this type of diet. I was having um, breakfast with a friend of mine several years ago. She ordered a half a cup of heavy cream, a quarter cup of coffee, six strips of bacon, and two sausage patties, and proceeded to tell me about her new diet that she was following. <laughs> you guys are giggling. You know what it was. I didn't. Okay. I was younger then. Okay, so the history of the ketogenic diet goes back to the Mayo Clinic in 1921. This was before CF was... Dorothy Anderson. But again, 1921, they were using this diet to help treat epilepsy. This diet is still used today in some kids who have seizures to control seizures when medications don't work. But it is a very low carbohydrate diet, and I should have bolded very low, because the makeup of this diet is 90% of the calories from fat, 6% from protein, and 4% from carbohydrate. Again, very low carb. Um, the theory behind this diet is that you have less carbohydrate, less insulin release, less captured and potential stored energy, and weight loss. You will lose diet. You lo will lose weight on this diet, guaranteed. Um, the additional modes of action is that sometimes the higher fat and protein can actually make you feel fuller, higher metabolic rate, and increased mobilization of fat stores or ketogenesis. I decided to put a quick slide in here on some low-carb diets because I think you probably hear about these, especially in adult care. So again, there's multiple types of low-carb diets out there, and they're defined by both the percentage of calories from carbohydrate and then an empiric amount. So starting off with the very low carbohydrate, less than 10% of your calories from carbs, that's only about 20 to 50 grams of carbs a day. Do you know how many carbs are in a banana? 20, 25, like that's it. So this is very low carb. This is my friend's diet. Um, ketogenic diet, Atkins diet, these are the very low carb diets. Then you have the low carb less than 26% from carbohydrate. This is about 130 grams. Doesn't that sound much better? This is like your Whole30, your restart diet, or your Banting diet. And then you have moderate carbohydrate diet. This is between 26 to 44% of your calories from carbs. This is like your South Beach, your zone diet. Um, remember when the US new, USDA recommended guidelines for Americans for carbohydrates, 45 to 60 percent of our calories from carbs. So a, the South Beach diet starts kind of like as a low-carb diet, then they add in more fruits and vegetables, but it's still a moderate carbohydrate diet. The big thing with the ketogenic diet, and if you have anyone starting it, they need to talk to their doctors about it. Reason being, we have a few concerns. I have a whole slide of them. Um, so the first week, you're going to have issues with the carbohydrate withdrawal. You're going to have headaches, some muscle aches, fatigue, hypoglycemic, possibly if you're active. Um, I'm from Colorado. People are really active where I'm at. And people run into problems with low blood sugars on this diet. Um, the higher fat can cause some delayed gastric emptying, some increased reflux, um, some constipation related to not having as much fiber, um, higher risk of kidney stones, acidosis with the lower levels of bicarbonate with the ketosis. And again, it's contradicted if you have kidney, heart, liver disease, diabetes, eating disorder, pregnant, or nursing. So a few concerns. Paleo diet. Number 30. Best Diet for 2022, U.S. News and World Report. Um, the history of the paleo diet is that the rate of chronic disease in the hunter-gatherer culture was much lower than in the cultures eating a Western diet. Essentially, this diet is based on if a caveman didn't eat it, then you shouldn't either. And that's how I remember this diet, because that's the mechanism of action. It's what a caveman used to eat. There's no grains, dairy, legumes, processed foods, refined sugars, added salt, 
It's a consumption of lots of fruits and vegetables, eggs, nuts, seeds, meat, focuses on lean meat, but entire food groups are eliminated. There's concerns because we're eliminating entire food groups. So again, we definitely need to add some supplements if someone is serious about this diet. Um, they're not going to be getting enough vitamin D, B vitamins, calcium. Um, the high fat is not always heart healthy, and it's not recommended if you're a diabetic. So the last diet I'm going to talk about is fasting for dieting, okay? Number 27 for intermittent fasting by U.S. News and World Report. Um, the history of this goes back to Victor Longo doing his research on intermittent fasting in 2018. He also made Time Magazine for um, a fad diet. And he was called the fasting evangelist because he had so many claims about the benefits of fasting. Um, mechanism of action for fasting, there's lots of ways of not to eat. Um, just trying to eat for shorter time frames. A lot of the movie stars talk about this. They, do, they call it like the nine to five diet. And you just eat between nine and five o'clock at night. And then you don't eat anything past five o'clock because you don't want to go to bed hungry. I don't know about you, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to eat for dinner tonight. So I would not do good with that diet. The other one is called the 5-2 diet. This is where for five days out of the week, you eat your caloric intake. So for a female, it's 2,000 calories, recommended caloric intake on this diet. But then two days of the week, you only eat a quarter of that or 500 calories. So that's your fasting. So during that fast time, you're depleting your fat stores instead of glucose for energy. Again, the benefits, Victor Longo made Time Magazine. So again, lots of benefits noted. Uh, improved insulin sensitivity, reduced inflammation, lower heart disease, reduction in markers of oxidative stress. But there's lots of concerns too with intermittent fasting. There's increased cravings after fasting leading to increased consumption. There's possibly the risk of headaches, lightheadedness, increased irritability. Does anybody get hangry? Like you get hungry and you're angry? Okay, other mood changes, sleep disturbances, dehydration, hypoglycemic risk, adrenal fatigue, micronutrient deficiencies. And yes, it can be dangerous not to be eating when you're taking certain medications like blood pressure medicine, insulin, antibiotics. And the, these diets lack nutritional guidance on what constitutes healthy eating on those non-fasting days. It was just kind of like eat 2,000 calories. So food for thought. Listen to what diet changes your patients are making um, as the legacy diet is not for every CF patient. I have to say, as a dietitian, a lot of times I hear, oh, their BMI is okay, you don't need to see them today. But this diet thing is kind of hard. I think the dietitian needs to continue seeing their, your, our patients, even if their BMI is okay, because diet, the diet's confusing. It's not easy. So ask why your patients are making these diet changes. Is it because of allergies, weight loss? They just want to eat healthier, other beliefs. Um, make sure they're not making diet changes that could put them at harm. Make recommendations for nutrients that, can get, that they can get from other foods if they're limiting that, those food groups in their diet. And the most important thing, the consumption of a diet makes no difference in weight loss if energy intake is more than energy expenditure. And in conclusion, uh, optimal nutrition with appropriate body weight remains integral to CF treatment. CF patients, families, CF center teams, dietitians should all work together to give individual dietary management based on needs and preferences to attain nutritional goals. We need to support healthy eating habits throughout the lifespan, starting at a young age. And most importantly, hold judgment, listen to your patients as they discuss their diets and their supplements. And that's it.
We have time for about one to two questions. I know a lot of you came in uh, from the plenary, so just a reminder, four questions. If you go to your app, at the bottom there's a Q&A button. If you click on that button, it takes you to a discussion board. You want to click the middle tab to go to Q&A, and those will appear up here. Um, and then if you see some questions there that you want to kind of vote up as a high priority, you can hit vote on it so that you're not asking the same questions but voting those up higher. All right, Judy, so one question we have is several CF patients report difficulty transitioning from legacy diet to healthful diets. Do you re recommend any social media resources, podcasts, or YouTube channels to supplement the um, dietitian in clinic education? I work in pediatrics. I like starting with the dietitian. Um, I think some of our other speakers are going to be talking about some other resources more related to adults. So again, um, me personally, I like the Mediterranean diet. Um, I think it's an easier diet to follow. Yeah. And then how do you handle um, patients who want to maybe stop their modulators due to the weight gain versus altering the diet? Yeah, so we do that as a team approach a lot of times. I think the physicians um, usually are the ones who are discussing that more so. We kind of support, we kind of all work together and support each other. But um, again, I think it's a matter of taking a closer look. How are you eating, you know? Thinking, I used the example of the Scandi shake. I know a lot of people weren't in here Drew and I was going through that, but I have been a dietitian for so long. I we used we started with skim milk, and then we went to whole milk, and then we went to Scandi shake, and then we made it into a milkshake. Now I feel like we almost need to work backwards and go back to the skim milk, and start encouraging more you know fruits and vegetables for snacks and exercise. You know I think after the pandemic, we all need to get out and get exercising, and. Think of it with traveling. You know, we all traveled here to Philadelphia. I don't know about you. I have not eaten well at all since I've gotten here. And I think I need to go back and see a dietitian to hit my restart button. So I think, again, you know, just see how you can make healthy eating part of your lifestyle. And keep taking your modulators because that is so important. I'm going to do one more question because okay. it was highly voted up, so I just want to okay. address it. But how do you guide teens with body image challenges and the healthy diets? I am blessed to have some wonderful psychologists on staff. So we all kind of work together with body image. And um, again, we have also a really good um, physical therapist. So we work, a I wish we could gain weight as muscle. But we can't. We gain it as fat, and we have to work it into muscle. So I feel like having the physical therapist and having the psychologist, uh, getting the team together helps with the body image. Wonderful. Thank you so much, so, Judy. Thank you. For those of you standing up in the back, there are several seats down here in the front if you want to come in and join us. Our next speaker is uh, Becca Summer. Her discussion, um, sorry, you just put your relationship on there, didn't you? <laughs> Rethinking the CF diet nutrition recommendations with extended life expectancy. Becca is a certified senior dietitian for the adult program at Indiana University, so I am blessed to have her as my dietitian. She's been with us for seven years. We have a population of over 300 adult patients. She keeps very busy. Currently, she is working on QI projects with physical therapy and other research projects. She's been a mentor for the dietitian program for the foundation. She's spoken several times to various groups about nutrition-related cystic fibrosis and other disease processes. She's great to have in clinic, and she always makes us laugh every day. So welcome, Becca. Hi. Like she said, I'm Becca. Hopefully this talk is as fun as clinic is. 
Um, these are my kiddos. They're way cuter than I am. Um, they keep the other half of my job very busy. Um, clinic gets lots of stories of them, too. Um, but so a lot of my talk is kind of going to be continuing with what Judy talked about. Um, so as we are all very aware, it's all over conference this year, everyone's talking about it, um, with increased life expectancy. So per CFF, a child born between 2017 and 2021, the median predicted age is 53. Um, so that's up to 38 years in just a decade. Um, so now, especially because I am in the adult realm, we're, I mean, we have a guy in his 80s. So we are seeing geriatric, we are seeing young adult. It is full lifespan of CF care now. Um, so when I started in CF, it was very different even just seven years ago. Um, so we are adjusting our practice and clinic. We're coming up with new ideas um, and things that we can do to kind of keep up with this rapid changing. Um, so kind of what Judy talked about, that legacy diet. So originally the basic was to support growth in pediatrics. So the legacy diet came back out when it was basically a childhood disease and we were trying to get these kiddos to grow. Um, we were trying to get them into adulthood, make it to adulthood, um, support decreased lung function, as well as supporting malabsorption due to pancreatic insufficiency. Um, so goals, same while that you're probably all very aware of these, um, center reports show where you are and all these. Um, for pediatrics, the goal was always to get their um, BMI percentile to greater than 50th percentile. Adults, we want to hit that BMI of 23 for males and 22 for females. So a lot of our nutrition was focused on trying to get those. So a lot of times the dietitian would go into the room, they'd be like, oh, their weight's down, they're struggling gaining weight, they can't get past the BMI of 19. Um, so a lot early on when we were really struggling with weight, that was a lot of things dietitians were focusing on, looking at, were addressing, trying to get patients to hit those, those goals. But that's not really what's happening anymore. Um, so I did request from the registry to pull a report of BMI trends, um, and I asked them to split them up in different BMI categories. Um, so this was, it gives us a few years before Trikafta, and then a couple years after Trikafta. Um, so if you look at BMI of less than 18, so that's kind of if you were to just be in the hospital, general patients are considered to be underweight with a BMI less than 18. Um, that's going down, which is, that's great. We've had, you know, a 36% decrease um, from 2019 to 2021. Um, that BMI of 19 to 24, which you look at the general population that's considered healthy, that's also within our BMI target goal. So even if we're looking, still focusing on that target goal of a BMI of 22 and a BMI of 23 for adults, that's actually decreasing. We're actually down 6% of people that fit into that category. Um, the BMI range of 25 to 29, so that's when, when you look at BMI um, and weight status, that's considered overweight. It's up 30%. The really high increase are our, our obese population. It looks really small because we used to not have obese people, so it's that bottom line there at the bottom. Um, so I wanted to pull the data because the actual percent changed because that's more significant than what the lines look like. But the BMI increase from 30 to 35 is 47%. And the BMI increase of greater than 35 is 49%. So dietitians, clinics, we are changing. Um, so it is no longer pounding the Scandi shakes plus the caramel plus the, all the things. Um, and kiddos, I am on the adult side, so this is about the extent of my CF pediatric knowledge. <laughs> um, but the kiddos, the biggest change that they're seeing, there was a decrease in the BMI percentile less than 10%, which is great. There's a 21% decrease in that. Um, there's a 15% decrease in the BMI of 10 to 28%. Um, but there was also a 21% increase in the BMI greater than 85 for percentiles. Um, so in our clinic, we also started to focus on body composition. Um, I don't know how your clinic dietitians are, but I also got tired of just focusing on people's weight and bashing our heads in the wall of why we can't get a BMI over 19. Um, so we started, we got a physical therapist in our clinic too, and I was really interested in looking at 
how can we have more productive weight gain? How can we have more productive conversations with our patients? Um, Because, you know, everyone wanted better lung function. Um, So there were studies or some research out there with increased lean body mass results in improved lung function, uh, lower fat-free mass associated with lower diaphragm muscle mass, and lower lean body mass has also been associated with worse lung function in CF. Um, so we started looking at this in clinic. We still looked at BMI, we still looked at weight trends, um, but we started in the beginning of 2019, basically up until the p- pandemic, and then everyone got sent home and we didn't see each other for a while. Um, but over the course of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, we did get 141 adult patients. Um, we got a portable um, BIA scale in our clinic. Um, it's located in our PFT lab. So we use um, the TANTA, the TBF410 uh, body composition scale. Um, the criteria for healthy weight, we just went by the manufacturer guidelines that was over the WHO BMI guidelines. So for females that are 20 to 39 years of age, a healthy fat percentage is 21 to 33. For those that are 40 to 59 is 23 to 34 percent. And then 60 to 79 years of age is 24 to 36 percent. Males for 20 to 39 years are 11 to 20 percent. Males 40 to 59 are 11 to 22. And the 60 to 79 are 13 to 25. And exciting is we have people in all of those ranges, so they're now all applicable. Um, So our data, so what I started noticing is when we looked at the BMI composition is once patients were getting a BMI of 20, most of our patients had adequate fat stores. Um, The exception was we did have three athletes. Um, Two of them were males, one was a female. We had one African-American female, um, two non-athletic Caucasian Caucasian females, and then one non-athletic male. But the rest of ours, once they hit that BMI of 20, their fat stores were good. And then everyone who had a BMI of 18 or less had inadequate fat stores, which was not surprising. Um, That was about 14 um, of our patients, about 9.5%. Patients with excessive fat mass were about 22.6% of our patients. Um, So there were 13 females and 17 males, so it was pretty equally distributed. Um, And then... COVID happened, we kind of took a break, and then I was like, we should probably go back to doing body composition again. Um, So it was kind of one of those things that slowly came back into getting into routine of clinic. So we did look at patients in the month of September. Um, So it is a much smaller patient sample, but we did get 65 adult patients. Um, I kind of stuck with that kind of trend of looking at that BMI of 20, was that still applicable? Um, We had two Amish males um, that had a BMI of 20 or greater, but were very, very lean and had low body fat composition. One African-American female, it's the same one. Um, And then four non-athletic Caucasian females. Um, For the BMI of 18, they all still had inadequate fat stores. Um, That was still about 10%. And then patients with excessive fat mass was 30%. Um, And there was 15 males, so 23%, and then five males, or 7.6. So the biggest change that I noticed between 2019 and 2020 was the percentage of people that had excessive fat, and there was a very large increase in our female population. Um, So I think when I look at who came in that clinic, I think it's a pretty good gauge of a good mix of our clinic. That's not like just all of our over excessive fat females came in one month. Um, But when I kind of look through our patients, I have noticed that a lot of our females have gained lots of weight and it's primarily been fat mass. Um, So kind of what I'm gonna talk to is about looking at maybe how can we do nutrition changes and talking to our patients about nutrition, especially at disease states that they're at risk for. Um, I think now we're at the stage that what I tell my patients is now we can really focus on nutrition. Like now we get to do real nutrition, which makes me super excited as a dietitian. I think everyone in clinic thinks I'm crazy half the day, but I get super excited about it. Um, Because I feel like a lot of times, especially in the adults, 
they're done growing. So now I said we focus on optimizing your health, and now we can do nutrition for health um, versus just nutrition for catabolic needs. Um, and we can focus on like how to make you feel better, how to make you live better. Um, so some of our my patients are super on board and excited about it. Others are like, that sounds kind of terrible. I like being able to eat whatever I want to eat. That was the benefit of CF, and you're taking that away. Um, I do tell people transitioning. I'm like, I'm kind of doom and gloom. Adult nutrition's kind of lame, and that kind of have to care. Um, but I do have patients that are, are appreciative and are interested and are very conscious about health. Um, so one of the biggest risk factors is CF-related diabetes. Um, and so we know the prevalence increases with age, and our patients are aging. Um, start screening at 10 years of age. Um, with the 2019 registry report, about 20% of people with CF have CF-related diabetes. Um, we're having a lot more pregnancies. Our clinic had a pregnancy explosion. I think that's what brought us all back to clinic um, after the pandemic is we were rapidly trying to <laughs> keep up with all the pregnancies. I don't know how many we had that first year. It was a lot. Um, so they're at risk for gestational diabetes. So diet can play a role. I have actually had some patients be really successful with making diet modifications and not having to jump straight to insulin. Um, so we look at glucose levels. We have them keep food logs, check um, blood sugars. If you know there's spikes, they, the food logs come back to me as well, and I also look at why are they spiking? Can we make diet changes? Because it is another burden of care, and a lot of people aren't like, woohoo, insulin, yay. Um, so it is a realm that, you know, encouraging healthier choices, looking at food patterns um, can also help just one, decrease risks, but also decrease an extra burden that's going to be added in terms of care. Um, they are at increased risk for colon cancer. They're five times greater risk for colorectal cancer. Um, diagnosing is earlier for CF. Um, it starts screening at 40. So we have a lot of patients that are approaching those. So all my 37-year-olds start getting warned about this. Um, they are also higher for patients that have had lung transplants or any kind of solid organ transplant. So they start screening at 30. Um, and the causes for this is the CFTR, the role it plays in epithelial homeostasis, altered intestinal microbiota, chronic inflammation, high fat diets, um, altered bile acid, metabolism, um, and potentially other causes. So then when you also look at what does the general population recommend to prevent colon cancer? It's a high fiber diet, high in fruits, vegetables, whole grains. The CF legacy diet is not that. Um, so when you also look at the, the foods that these patients have been told to eat, taught to eat, especially once they come over to the adult realm, and I'm like, well, you might become a diabetic, you might get colon cancer, it's all these great things. They're like, oh, yeah. Um, Decrease red meat, processed meats, um, limit alcohol, two drinks per day for men, and one drink a day for females. There's also lots and lots of just GI issues, and I think now we're at the stage, too, that we can really dive into these. I think before, we were worried to make lots of diet modifications because there was fear of weight loss. Um, so a lot of times, you know, before we had highly effective modulators and people were in this kind of catabolic state, the focus was just keeping up with these energy burns. But now that, as you can see, as people are becoming obese, if you make diet modifications and you lose five to 10 pounds as a result, that might be positive and it might help reduce your health risk. Um, so there was an international qualitative survey on GI symptoms. It included healthcare professionals, um, patients with CF, and their families. Um, the symptoms that were reported, the patients and families most commonly reported stomach cramps, pain, bloating, um, and then just a combination of a variety of GI symptoms. Um, the healthcare providers reported reduced appetite, bloating, constipation. 58% um, of the families and patients felt that medications helped with GI symptoms, and only 50% felt that laxatives helped. So if you think of how much constipation we see, 46% um, of those felt that diet and exercise help relieve symptoms. So it's another opportunity that we can really optimize diet, and we can utilize PTs, we can utilize dietitians. One is, you know, if we can reduce another medication that they have, and they feel better, um, and laxatives don't always work. So some of the diet interventions that they did was reducing 
um, processed food, increasing fruits and vegetables, working on hydration. Um, I think half my chronic constipation patients are probably dehydrated because um, they're used to drinking sodas, caffeinated uh, beverages. I had one patient, she's like, well, maybe I drink a bottle of water a day. I'm like, okay, well, let's start with two, and we'll keep working on that. Um, so recommendations going forward. So I think we're at this stage where it really needs to be individualized. Um, and it does need to be a team approach. I think the whole team, I'm very, very lucky in the team that I work with and that we all talk to each other. We're all in the same area. Um, we reinforce what each other says. Um, so I feel very supported as a dietitian, but then I also feel like I know what team members have been told by other people. So it, we collaborate. And I think that gives the best message most consistent to patients. Because um, as current nutrition status, I think this is getting tricky. I feel like before a lot of times we just looked at the weight and kind of like Judy said, well, their BMI is good. Do they need to see the dietitian? And I think nutrition status is getting a lot more complicated than just weight. So I still think it's very important even if your patients are normal weight, the dietitian stays well established. Um, one is to continue rapport. So when they hear all these crazy diets and things out there, they have that dietitian contact that they have maintained relationships with and can ask questions about it as well. And also when we look at nutrition status, I mean, some of my patients' diets are still terrible. Um, and their weight looks fine. So they come to clinic and you get in the weight, their lung function's not terrible. But when you get into the nitty gritty of like, well, a lot of your constipation might just be your food choices. Um, I had one patient who was eating a Pop-Tart for breakfast, an oatmeal cream pie for lunch, and a frozen dinner for dinner. And I was like, oh, okay. So I still think having the dietitian go in, doing good food recalls really gives you an idea of why, what are they doing to maintain that BMI? Even if the BMI is in a good range and we're happy with where it is, are they really well nourished to meet that? Um, our physical therapist is also doing hand grip strength too, just to help assess functional strength. So she and I have been tag teaming a lot working on, she supports exercise, I work on the nutrition to support the exercise. So I do think the nutrition status is getting a little more complicated and a little more in depth. So I say use your dietitians, keep them on hand um, because you can always get better. Um, like I said, I'm at the point where I'm hoping that we can continue optimizing with our patients. Um, and then age, I had a patient who told me, she was like, oh, I have CF. I didn't think metabolism applied to me. I was like, no, end today, you're a human. Um, your metabolism does slow down, I know. Being an adult sucks. Um, and then in terms of sex, males often have higher calorie needs. A lot of this is just muscle composition too. Um, and then activity. We have some patients too, now that they're on highly effective modulators, they're looking at doing endurance sports. We have a patient who wants to do an ultra marathon. I volunteered to be her team member and I'll nourish her. And I was like, do it somewhere cool and I can come. Um, but it, it's making sure, I mean, her BMI is great. She's nutritionally knowledge, but then looking at, you know, are they taking their activity to the next level? Are they going to need more calories for what they're doing? Nutrition, um, hydration, salt repletion still. Um, and then body composition is also knowing the higher muscle mass, higher energy needs. Um, Absorption needs to continue to be addressed. So, you know, address nutrient losses. Um, and then some patients, I've had a lot of patients that now that they have some flexibility, they're open to not extreme elimination diets, but looking for food triggers. And I've had a lot of patients that eliminating dairy or other food triggers have made a huge impact. They've been able to come off of laxatives. So even their weight is great, but they're still having significant GI. So we can still change diet. We can still optimize nutrition to help. And then severity. So there still is going to be patients that have end-stage lung disease, and that still is going to impact their nutrition needs. Um, so these are kind of just little steps that I give my patients. Um, you know, a lot of mine is re-education and de-education, um, especially, you know, people that were diagnosed over 30 years ago. Um, so one is just baby steps. Try to eat some fruits and vegetable. A lot of times I'll say, just try to have a fruit in the morning. Even if you still have your Pop-Tart, try have fruit with it. Um, just to kind of retrain habits. Um, and then try to reduce, eliminate added sugars. So depending on where they are in terms of wanting to change, um, maybe you know we just reduce your soda intake or we reduce your gummy bear intake. Um, 
Reduce and eliminate fried foods, same thing. I kind of look at where is the patient at, how much of this are they doing, and are they super motivated, or do we just need to start with small reductions? Um, increasing water consumption. This is something that I push pretty hard um, because I do think, one, it helps energy levels because we help with hydration and it helps GI. And if you're drinking a ton of water, then you have less room for a ton of pop. That's kind of awesome, I hope, but... Um, and then I do teach balanced eating and just kind of meal planning, like thinking a little more intentionally about your meals versus just eat. Um, and then a little bit of intuitive eating too for patients that are interested um, and starting to like, we have patients too that are trying to stop overeating because they're just been told and like programmed to eat, eat, eat. Um, so this can also be helpful. Um, and then finally, the biggest thing is education, is making sure your patients understand what their nutrition needs are. A lot of my patients are just confused. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing anymore. Um, so I go through them like what I consider is a healthy weight, what's adequate growth, what are their nutrient needs. So not just calories, but like essential fatty acids and go through just and make it more nutrition focused and calorie focused. And then why their nutrition needs and recommendations may be changing with different phases of their life. Thank you. So your data was popular. Um, <laughs> And we have a few questions, so thank you all for sure. upvoting. It's helping to prioritize that. Um, so what was the cost of adding the scale to clinic, and how did you get funding for that? That's sure. the first part. Um, so like I said, I am very lucky. Um, so our medical director sent a message to everyone on the team and said, I have extra grant funds. What do you want? And I said, I want a body composition scale. Um, we had a lot of money. It was $3,500. I got to be a little picky. <laughs> And then um, how has it benefited your patients from using that data, from seeing that data? Yeah, so our patients like it. Um, I don't always go into the nitty gritties of everything. Um, so when they come in, Amber, our respiratory therapist is here. She graciously does them all, so it's just part of their routine visit. Um, and then I kind of go through and I'll say, like, looks like, you know, your fat stores are adequate. So when I talk to patients about, like, if they're underweight, and then I tur turn as a tool, of, like, you would really benefit, like, if you... So some of my patients really want to gain weight still, and they're still underweight and they're frustrated. So we talk about what weight is actual productive weight. Because um, a lot of our patients, if you're hitting that BMI of 20 and you have good fat stores and all you're doing is gaining fat mass, um, we can ha start having conversations of that may or may not actually be productive weight gain for you, especially if they're not having frequent exacerbations. Um, I have some patients that are like, well, my 20 pound weight loss every year from getting sick no longer happens. Um, so we're not seeing those patients with dives. So once their fat stores are pretty adequate, then I really go in and we, I work with our physical therapists and we talk about strength gains, exercise gains. Um, the physical therapist does the evaluation of the strength and functional strength and all of that. Um, so it, it makes our conversations much more productive um, to kind of see where they are and is it a good range for them. Um, if someone comes in, we do have some people that have 40... 9% fat. Um, I don't use that as a way of going in and like, well, your fat's real high. Um, I usually just say like, do you have questions or concerns? Um, and then I try to make it about their health and their lung function and what kind of body composition better supports that versus saying you're over fat, you're under fat. It's just saying these are kind of where your stores are. This is the most beneficial gains or losses for you and why. Um, there was a question that kind of leads from what you just mm -hmm. said about um, is there any data to show that a high BMI um, has a negative impact on lung function? So we have some people with a BMI of like 26, 20, and they are ripped. Um, like they work out, they go to the gym. So I think when you're looking at BMI, you also really need to look at, you know, body distribution, is it adipose? Um, like we do have some patients that primarily just have abdominal obesity. Um, so that if you think of general pulmonary function and having lots of adipose tissue around the diaphragm and lungs, I am curious to see if we'll start now that we're having more and more post trichafta if there'll be more data about it. So I do think that I don't like just a BMI cutoff because I have some people that have a high BMI but are very, very healthy and very fit. 
um, and I wouldn't go in a room and say, you really need to get your BMI down. And then how would you deal with food sensitivities in adult patients? So do you have strategies that you've used in the past? Yeah, so a lot of my approach is just asking a bajillion questions when I go into a room. Um, so when they come in, I kind of have a GI assessment that I kind of go through lots of, is this going on, is this going on? And then we try things. And then if medication doesn't work, hydration doesn't work, then we kind of get more into how would, would you like to look into possible foods? Um, I feel like taking away food from patients is really kind of a sensitive thing, so I usually ask the patient, is this something that you would want to try? Um, and so sometimes we'll go through, I will pull up, um, I do a modified low FODMAP diet in a sense, where I pull up a lot of high FODMAP foods, and sometimes we do initial screen, think back and do you ever notice issues with these? So I kind of try to hit common food sensitivities and just see if they've ever noticed that they have more issues with those and kind of start that way versus doing a really strict elimination diet and saying just take everything away. Um, or we try to pinpoint or I'll try them to do it like for a week. How about you try a week and like we'll eliminate dairy or we'll try to figure out too like is the bloating, is it every time you eat, is it certain times of the day, um, how is it in relation to stooling. So I try to eliminate constipation, EPI or other things first um, to try to find trends and then see if it may be food related. Okay, we have time for one more question. Sure. So I'll do uh, the highest point here is um, as seen in the data with the one African-American woman who had inadequate um, fat mass based on BMI, then BMI is based on Caucasian men. Yeah. And so it's uh, not very robust population included in those calculations. So how do we move away from the standards derived from BMI and find a measure that represents the entire population? Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer for all of that. Um, so. I, I think that's where it kind of goes in when I'm saying a nutrition assessment is getting more complicated. And I think that's where you use these as tools and guides. So like when I go in, like every time a patient gets room, I check and see their weight is. And I, I just look at kind of relation to last time they were here, is there any big changes? Um, but I also look at the patient and figure out, okay, this is what the BMI is saying. This is what the body composition is saying. This is what you're eating. This is what you're doing. And I won't make assessment based on one of those things. Um, so I, I do think, yes, we do have limitations in terms of what are certain standards appropriate for and not appropriate for. Um, so you'll always have those outliers. Um, I think we have three African Americans in our clinic out of 300. So they're 3% of our clinic. Um, so I just put it in just as a note to say, you know, She's a very healthy weight. She's very well nourished. Um, so I'm not going to go in there and tell her that she's underweight or under fat stores and push something. So I, I think that's where you have to look at the patient as an individual and take everything into consideration. Um, use the tools as tools and guides, but then also be able to evaluate them when they might not be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there's time at the end, we will try to address questions that weren't answered. Um, but now, we will move on to Caitlin Kennis. So Caitlin is a dietitian at uh, the Adult CF Center in Central Texas, um, and she graduated with a bachelor's degree in nutrition services from the University of Texas at Austin, and a master's degree in public health with a combined dietetic inter internship from the University of Texas Health Center, uh, Health Science Center at Houston. So prior to working with CF, she did work with both inpatient and outpatient organ transplant patients in Houston, and she's excited to be here. All right, thanks for joining me here this afternoon. Um, like was already previously mentioned, my name is Caitlin, and today I'll be, my, the title of my talk is What's Up With CF Sups, Vitamin, Mineral, and Other Supplements in Review. So I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. 
um, and an overview. Today I'll be talking about uh, the definitions of complementary and alternative medicine. I'll be reviewing um, common supplements that I see my adult patients taking, um, including reasons why they take them, um, some of the pros and cons for those supplements, and then I'll be finishing up discussing the importance of collaborating with pharmacy and the rest of the CF team in regards to supplements. All right, so starting off with some definitions. Um, complementary and alternative medicine, aka CAM, is defined is the term that's used for medical practices and products that are outside of standard medical care. Complementary medicine is used alongside standard medical care. And an example that's not related to CF might be a person with cancer who is being treated with chemotherapy, but is also choosing to receive acupuncture to help with some of those medication side effects. Um, while alternative medicine differs in that it is used instead of standard medical care, and going off with that same example um, of a cancer patient, this person differs in their treatment in that they're refusing chemotherapy, and they're instead choosing a special diet to follow in order to treat their cancer. There are several types of complementary and alternative medicines, including biologically based practices found in nature, and these include dietary supplements, including vitamins and minerals, botanicals, including herbs and spices, and special diets and foods. And bringing this all together, integrative medicine is medical care that combines both standard medical practices and CAM practices that are backed by science and are therefore safe and effective. And many of the CF patients that are taking the supplements I'll be discussing today are doing so for an integrative medicine approach. So prior to working with CF, with my public health background, I didn't really ever consider supplements just because they are often too expensive for most of the population. Um, and then working with transplant patients, especially in the beginning parts of transplant, part of my assessment was to go in, talk to the patient, figure out what supplements they are taking, and to, the, and to just tell them to stop. Um, because, you know, in the end, they might interact with some of the anti-rejection medications. Um, it could affect their eligibility for transplant if they weren't willing to stop those. And so I didn't really ever consider supplements. And then when I first started working with CF, they came in a whole long list of supplements, and I asked the rest of the team, what am I supposed to do about that? And they're like, oh, you can just allow them. And so that was definitely new for me. Um, and so a lot of this research that I did for this presentation um, helped inform me as well, just because I, I wasn't aware of um, recommending supplements that weren't due to a deficiency that was present. So starting off with fish oil. Um, fish oil is one of the sources of, or it contains omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. Um, it's often promoted for its anti-inflammatory benefits. Fish oil supplements contain two omega-3 fatty acids, including DHA and EPA. Food sources of omega-3 fatty acids include salmon, mackerel, oysters, flax and chia seeds, walnuts. The RDI, or excuse me, the RDA for total omega-3 fatty acids is 1600, 1,600 milligrams a day for men and 1,100 milligrams a day for women, while the RDI for combined DHA and EPA is 250 to 500 milligrams a day. So, for example, if you have a 1,000 mil 1, milligram fish oil supplement, that could contain approximately 300 milligrams EPA and DHA, but this could vary on, with each specific supplement. So going into the pros and cons, Studies have shown that omega-3 fatty acids found in fish oil supplements are heart healthy, and intake can lower elevated triglycerides and increase the good, whoop, increase the good LDL, the, the good, excuse me, HDL cholesterol. For management of elevated triglycerides, it is recommended to supplement with four grams a day of omega-3 or fish oil supplements. Um, and there was a greater benefit found for supplementation for people with heart disease compared to just your healthy individual choosing to take omega-3 um, as an additional supplement. Fish oil supplements may also benefit dry eye disease by improving the eye's oil film. Um, one of our adult patients came in 
Um, he was developing a lot of styes that he thought was due to trichafta. Our doctors weren't really sure if that was a common side effect. That's what he was contributing it to. Um, and he ended up seeing an eye doctor and they recommended that he supplement with fish oil. And the next time he came back, three months later, his styes were gone. So he contributed that to the fish oil. Um, so it could have something to do with improving the eye health. A small benefit was also found in reducing ADHD symptoms, including improving mood swings and oppositional behavior after taking fish oil for at least three months. And then finally, there was a study that found that fish oil supplementation might lead to improvement in lung function and increased essential fatty, acid, increased essential fatty acid levels in people with CF, um, but there wasn't enough of an improvement for a routine recommendation of fish oil to all of our CF patients. Now going into the cons, um, while there is no identified upper level or upper intake limit, um, high dosage greater than 900 milligrams of EPA and 600 milligrams of DHA per day may decrease immune function by suppressing inflammatory responses. Um, high dosage may also cause an increased bleeding risk by reducing platelet aggregation. Uh, so it is recommended to stop supplementation prior to planned surgeries. Um, and to watch for interactions with warfarin or any other anticoagulant medications. Fish oil supplementation may also limit vitamin E absorption. So this could end up lowering vitamin E levels and that's one of the fat soluble vitamin levels that we, we routinely check in our CF patients. And some studies also found that fish oil supplementation, while it, increase, it can also increase our bad LDL cholesterol. So while a lot of people are taking it to increase their HDL, there were some studies that found that it also increased the LDL. And then common side effects that probably many of you have heard of, um, of take, from taking fish oil include burping of fish taste, heartburn, GI distress, and then changes to the smell of body sweat, body odor. The next supplement here is probiotics. So probiotics are live microorganisms found in fermented foods and supplements. Many of the microorganisms in these supplements can also be found living in our body and our microbiome. Probiotics are strain specific and the most common bacteria groups found in probiotics are lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Food sources include yogurt, tempeh, miso, sauerkraut, kimchi, sourdough, kefir, and then as well as some other cheeses. Um, the probiotic supplement dosing for adults is 10 to 20 billion CFU, or colony forming units per day. And prebiotics are different from probiotics. Um, they're different in that they're actually non-digestible and can cause, or they're non-digestible food components and can cause good bacteria to start growing. So they're the, the food for our bacteria. And there are also symbiotic products available that contain both probiotic and prebiotics. Now going into their pros and cons. Um, pros, probiotics are found to reduce diarrhea that is caused by recent antibiotic use. Um, they've also been found to decrease both the duration and severity of acute infectious diarrhea. Several studies have shown that taking probiotics can lead to a reduction in the severity of IBS symptoms, including pain and bloating. And there's also evidence found, um, there's small evidence found for a decrease in the severity of upper respiratory infections from taking probiotics. Going into the cons, uh, probiotics may cause infections in patients that are high risk. So that includes our immune compromised patients um, or patients that have severe illnesses such as the critically ill hospitalized patient um, or premature infants. And it is also possible for antibiotic resistance to transfer from probiotic bacteria to microorganisms in the gut. And the common side effect that many patients complain of is increased gas when taking probiotics. All right, next one is creatine. Um, creatine has been very popular lately. I think most of our patients that are trying to bulk up or trying to, you know, those ones that are going to the gym a lot are probably taking creatine. Um, creatine is an amino acid derivative that is made in the kidneys, liver, and the pancreas. 
In the muscle tissue, creatine is stored as phosphocreatine, and it is used for the initial energy source for exercise, especially those explosive movements. So um, our sprinting, our weightlifting, um, jumping, things like that. Food sources include any of our animal products, so our red meats, our poultry, our fish, our dairy. And while most, or while there are many types of creatine supplements available, most of the research has been done on creatine monohydrate. Going into the pros and cons, um, research shows that taking creatine monohydrate three grams a day for 28 days increases the level of creatine stored in the muscles. So taking creatine and combining it with resistance training was shown to increase muscle mass and lead to improvements in those explosive movements that we talked about. Cons of creatine, um, so every person's body responds differently to creatine supplementation based off of our starting diet. So for example, for someone who contains mostly a plant-based diet, doesn't really eat any animal proteins, um, they're starting off with a lower, oops, let me see here, they'll have a higher creatine and fossil creatine levels after supplementation compared to someone who eats meat in the diet because they're starting off with a lower level. Therefore, greater benefits, supplementation benefits will be found for people who take creatine and who normally consume a plant-based diet. Water retention is also a common early side effect of creatine supplementation that many people complain of, and there's limited evidence that creatine supplementation will help in those aerobic ex exercise activities. Um, they might actually you know, cause your um, endurance exercises, cause you to slow down because of the increased body mass, increased water content in your body, things like that. Next one here is biotin or vitamin B7. Um, biotin is a B vitamin often promoted to benefit hair, skin, and nails. Food sources of biotin include eggs, fish, organ meats, nuts, seeds, sweet potatoes, and avocado. Food sources of biotin are bound to a protein and they need to be broken down first before our body can use that biotin. Once broken down, free biotin is absorbed in the small intestine and it's stored in the liver for use later on. Adequate intake is 30 micrograms a day for adult males, adult females, and during pregnancy, and increased to 35 micrograms during lactation. Biotin deficiency is rare um, in individuals that consume a normal diet. However, it can be found in people who have a biotinidase deficiency in chronic alcoholics. About 15% of chronic alcoholics um, are deficient in biotin. And women who are pregnant and breastfeeding are also at a higher risk for deficiency. Symptoms of that deficiency include hair thinning, brittle nails, skin rashes, aciduria, lethargy, and then also some neurological effects. Pros. Um, so studies on patients with brittle nails have found an increase in nail thickness from biotin, from biotin supplementation. However, the increase was not statistically significant. Biotin supplementation has also led to improvements in hair health for children who have hair shaft disorders. There's also small evidence of improvements in skin health, so rashes and dermatitis and in alopecia and in infants who were taking biotin supplementation. And there is no evidence of toxicity after supplementing with high amounts of biotin. Going into the cons, most of the biotin research has been done on individuals who are starting out with low biotin levels. So there isn't much, much research on a healthy individual taking extra biotin to try to you know, improve their nails or grow more hair. And while there's no evidence of a biotin toxicity, high doses of biotin supplementation can interact with some diagnostic laboratory tests, including um, thyroid and vitamin D function tests. And some of the research showed um, that supplementation with biotin could result in false positives for Graves' disease and other metabolic disorders. Um, biotin supplementation may also interact with some medications uh, and so that's important to watch out for, especially if you're on any epilepsy medications. The next supplement that I commonly see patients taking, especially in the era of COVID, is zinc. 
So zinc is an essential mineral that plays a role in DNA synthesis, um, cell signaling, and wound healing. Zinc supplementation is also often promoted to improve the function of the immune system. Food sources include our red meat, shellfish, beans, nuts, poultry, whole grains, and then fortified cereals and dairy. Common supplemental forms of zinc are zinc sulfate, zinc gluconate, zinc acetate, and a deficiency can affect the immune, central nervous, reproductive, and digestive symptoms. And deficiency is also rare. Um, it's more common in low to middle income countries. It's also common in patients um, who have any bariatric surgeries, veg vegetarians, pregnant lactating women, alcoholics, and the tolerable upper limit for zinc is 40 milligrams a day for adults. The pros and cons. Um, studies have shown a reduction in common cold duration from taking supplemental zinc acetate in the lozenge form. Um, this is due to zinc inhibiting rhinovirus replication and decreasing in decreasing nasal inflammation. Um, zinc used in a study as treatment for acute diarrhea and gastroenteritis in low-income countries was found to slightly shorten the diarrhea duration by improving the immune function, decreasing inflammation. Um, there was also an association found between zinc intakes and type 2 diabetes risks, and a systematic review found that people with a high intake of zinc had a lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Zinc supplementation was also found to benefit triglyceride and total cholesterol levels. And then some of the cons of zinc, um, excessive zinc intake or using too much uh, dental adhesive creams with, which often contain zinc can lead to a copper deficiency. And so that's something to look out for. High doses of zinc can also interfere with magnesium absorption. Um, zinc is also reduced in combination with iron supplements or diuretics. And there's lots of medication interactions to look out for. Um, I specifically wanted to mention Cipro because a lot of our patients do take Cipro. And then lastly, um, a supplement that I often see my patients taking is turmeric. Turmeric is a root plant grown in Southeast Asia, primarily India. Um, it's similar to ginger in that the root of the plant is dried, ground down, and then is either used as a cooking supplement or is used as a cooking spice or put into supplemental form. Um, turmeric contains curcumin, which gives it its bright color that we're you, you know, familiar with. It's probably stained somebody's um, cooking utensils. I know I have a couple stained <laughs> spoons that I got mad about after I cooked something with turmeric in it. Um, it's also been used in traditional Indian and Eastern Asian medicine. Um, it's advertised today as a dietary supplement to help with allergies, respiratory infections, inflammation, digestive disorders, and depression. Turmeric and curcumin can be difficult to study due to its unstable nature and low bioavailability in the bloodstream. Um, however, there are recent improvements in supplemental forms um, that have led to better studies being conducted. Pros. So turmeric is considered safe to consume both orally and topically up to eight grams a day, and that's a lot. Um, small clinical studies found that treating arthritis symptoms with turmeric supplements led to improvements comparable to the treatment of arthritis with NSAIDs. Um, other studies found that combining traditional diabetes treatments along with taking a turmeric supplement in patients that are either pre-diabetic or early diagnosed type 2 diabetics um, found to have improved fasting blood glucose and improved A1Cs. And then another study found um, that turmeric supplementation in patients that had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease found improvements in their lipid levels. Some of the cons, um, turmeric supplements may be unsafe to take during pregnancy as they are in higher concentrated amounts than you would normally use in cooking alone. Um, and research still needs to be done to determine the safety. And then finally, I just wanted to finish with discussing the importance of encouraging open discussions when it comes to supplements. Um, I like to always ask my patients why they're taking them and figure out how important they are to them. It's also important, um, along with that, that it's a no judgment zone when we're talking about supplements. Um, I don't want them to know my personal 
thoughts on it in the beginning. Um, I wanna know why they're taking them and then discuss the pros and cons that are science-based. Um, and then after a discussion, determining if the pros are outweighing the cons of those. And then um, finally collaborating with the rest of pharmacy staff, the rest of the multi multidisciplinary team um, to make sure that if there are any medication interactions to look out for, um, we discuss those and then also discussing um, supplement dosing guidelines with the whole team. These are my references. Any questions? We did get a lot of questions, so I'll have to limit them as okay. well. So thanks for upvoting, everybody. Um, so uh, the studies uh, that you made the slide with, and um, mm -hmm. somebody specifically asked about probiotics as well, but were they CF-specific studies or not? So I just looked at the general population. Um, there might be studies out there that are related to CF, but since I was new to these supplements in general, I wanted to see what, you know, the whole length of our research history on that supplement has been before then diving into the CF Pacific um, interactions or recommendations. Okay, and did the um, probiotic recommendations that you had on there, the two, um, was that for specific antibiotics? Do you know? It was the two listed, lactobacillus and then bifidobacterium were the ones that were mostly studied. Okay, those are the ones with most studies. Mm -hmm, but that I found most of the studies on. Okay, but well, yes. we don't know necessarily which antibiotics those are best for use with. I didn't mention okay. this. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, any long-term impacts or consequences on the kidneys with creatinine use? I mean, definitely that is something to consider because our kidneys are filtering um, the creatinine, they're filtering our protein intake. Um, so taking that into consideration when looking at the rest of their diet. If they already have a really high protein intake, then I'll probably caution them to also supplement with creatine. Um, but say they don't consume much protein in the diet and they're trying to um, gain muscle mass and they don't really want to eat meat or other plant-based sources of protein, and they are supplementing with creatine, I don't think it would be harmful. Um, so looking at the person as a whole. Okay, and then do you monitor zinc or copper levels in celiac disease CF patients? And are there any other like micronutrient labs that you would recommend? Could you repeat that? Are there, um, do you monitor zinc and copper levels in celiac disease CF patients? And are there any micro, micronutrient labs that you would recommend? Mm -hmm. um, at our clinic, we don't, I think we have one patient that has celiac um, that I know of. So I don't think our doctors are looking at anything specific, um, but it would be a good idea to look at those. Okay, and then we have someone from the UK who was asking, um, do you advise against turmeric with people who are on um, Trikafta? And in their practice, they advise against it for using with it based on pharmacist colleague advice. Um, it's likely a moderate liver, liver inhibitor in large doses, do you know? So in that case, I would definitely defer to our pharmacist. Okay. When it comes to any medication interactions, they're gonna be the expert there. Wonderful. <laughs> in the next talk. <laughs> um, and then there were several adult women who, oops, sorry, that was from the previous, they mixed them all together, sorry guys. Um, are there benefits to turmeric in cooking the same as in supplement form? My personal belief, and I don't know if this comes from my whole background in looking at food, is that I would rather someone use turmeric in cooking to get those health benefits. Um, than using a supplement. Just because there's more research on that, um, you can use it in cooking and still get the same benefit. I don't know if we necessarily need to have that high of a dosage. Um, but like I said, there wasn't studies that showed that it was harmful to go over more than eight grams a day. So I think that would just be a personal decision to talk to the patient about. Um, because I think it's always good to get creative with cooking and trying new kinds of foods with different spices. So that would be my recommendation. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank
All right, our final speaker this afternoon is Jonathan Grant, the clinical coordinator pharmacist with the Johns Hopkins Home Care Group Specialty Pharmacy Services in Baltimore. Dr. Grant began working with the CF community in 2015 when he established an integrated clinical outpatient pharmacy services for the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Center at John Hops John Johns Hopkins, excuse me. Dr. Grant enjoys serving and helping his patients by simplifying all that comes with medication management of CF, including drug information questions, insurance, and pharmacy navigation. And he also precepts and mentors students and youth through various outlets. Dr. Grant. Good evening now, everybody. Um, I want to first start by saying pharmacists love nurses, uh, so thank you all for inviting us here to uh, share this, this evening. Secondly, I understand I am standing between you all and the reception soon, so um, <laughs> thank you all very much so for um, bearing with me and to uh, staying here, and hopefully this is helpful and insightful. So we're going to talk about um, a CBD, a THC supplements, and essential oils, and, um, and let's go ahead and jump in. Oh, sorry, too fast. Uh, so I have no financial uh, relationships to disclose that are related to this presentation. Uh, so I want to start with um, what is a dietary supplement in general? And um, it's a really big umbrella. Um, and what falls under there, you have your vitamins, minerals, er herbs and botanicals, amino acids. Um, there are a lot of things that fall beneath this umbrella. Um, and it is very large. And as you can imagine, um, it can also be very hard to be regulated. And so another thing I wanted to highlight in terms of um, supplements, um, it really is a cash cow. Um, it is uh, flabbergasting how much, um, how much of a market share that is made with supplements. And so before the pandemic um, and the year before, there was a 5% increase in in that field. And then in the six weeks leading up to the, the first wave of the pandemic, it spiked 44% because everybody wanted to, to get their vitamins and their zinc and this and ginger and that and everything that was possibly may save them from what was going on. Um, and, um, and just the spike in multivitamins alone increased by 51% in, in March. And so that was crazy. And so we would think this, these umbrella, you know, it has to be strictly regulated, right? And restricted and monitored, who would think? Um, well, the FDA um, is responsible for, um, for the oversight of these uh, supplements. However, um, they, um, they focus on the safety and, um, and they make sure that there are, are not false claims or claims that are not substantiated. And so that's why each of the labels have to have, you know, this, this statement has not been regulated by or has not been approved by the FDA. Um, and so, but these supplements do not need approval from the FDA before they are marketed. And so a lot of this is just, is just really, really good marketing. And so like I challenge you all, like if you, if you have some free time on the weekend or on an evening, walk, in, walk into the vitamin shop or the vitamin store or down the vitamin aisle and just read and see what is, what is in there and how there are just so many brands of the, uh, so many um, different types of the same thing. Um, and it's just, it's just very interesting. Um, and the manufacturing firms um, do not have to provide evidence um, to the FDA of like, of any efficacy of, of what they are selling or what's in there. And so as I said before, um, so some of the requirements for the dietary supplements, they, they have to have in their name that it states that it is a supplement um, and uh, they have to in include um, where it was made, um, who packaged it and distributed it, the complete list of ingredients, um, and the active ingredient um, as well. Um, but, they're, but, but they're listed as supplemental facts. Um, and so that's what the manufacturer has to do. But again, this can all be done without the oversight of the FDA. It's just kind of, here's the supplement, here it is, and they can market it. And so um, who's responsible for the oversight? As I said, it's the FDA. Um, and the FDA, um, they do make an effort to monitor this stuff, but, um, and they look for, the, for potential illegal products and unsafe products. But this is done by random inspections, 
by the internet, by people um, filing complaints and saying, hey, I'm taking X supplement and it's making me, it's making me grow a third leg. And, and, and when they get enough of those, then they'll say, hey, we should really investigate this. That's, that's really kind of what happens. And, and, and unfortunately, if these things are not reported, it can just keep on happening and keep on harming someone. And so, and that, and that is the whole um, purpose of the FDA is to make sure that what is, is being um, consumed is safe. And so um, that's a, a key factor that I wanted um, to make here in, in terms of the supplements that we are going to talk about. And so um, the FDA, um, again, has limited resources to actually check and to follow that. Um, but they do want to focus first on public health emergencies and products that may have caused a serious injury or illness. Um, but they do not analyze the supplements before they are sold to consumers. And that's one of the key messages that I want you all to know and also share with your patients as well. Like, just because it's sold in, the, in a vitamin store or a health store does not necessarily mean that it's healthy. Okay? Um, I know that sounds like a, 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 contra, a contradiction, but it is the truth. Um, and the FDA also does not have the resources to analyze dietary supplements sent to the agency by consumers who want to know what is inside what they had, what they received, um, at least not in a in a more uh, large scale way. So, I like this picture here. When you're taking a supplement, to some degree, you're kind of rolling the dice. You don't know exactly what you're getting totally. Um, sometimes you know, and and the risk may be small, but like, but you don't know what's in there. And again, this is um, um, due to the setup of the FDA and, ha and how things are, and the, the opportunity that companies and people see and what they can sell in terms of the fear and the opportunity in people, and just how easy it is. Like, it's, it's an opportunity. Um, and so that's just something that we want to roll and put out there and, and just, you know, even in social media and just where things are, it's just so easy to promote almost anything, you know. Oh, this helped me grow my hair. This helped me do this or do that. And then, you know, just carries on like wildfire. Um, another thing as well, the composition of products will vary between different manufacturers and may even vary by different batches within the same manufacturer. There's so much variability. And so, um, because it, these are not um, necessarily um, tested and reviewed by the same people. It's all done by the manufacturer within their home, and it's not um, identified or brought up unless there's, there are a lot of issues around it. And so um, they can look, look, look different, uh, have different uh, purities and, sh and strengths, and um, it, it can be a hot mess. So I do want to share something um, for you guys to, to take away. So the United States Pharmacopeia, or USP, um, is an independent nonprofit organization um, that um, companies can voluntarily send their products to and have it verified through a three-step process, um, through, through audits, through product quality control and manufacturing process evaluation and product testing. And so if you are in the vitamin aisle or you have a patient and they can find a product that has this USP seal here that you see on the screen, as a pharmacist, I'm okay with that, right? Because I know that what's, what they say on the label is in there, I'm pretty confident is going to actually be in there. And so this is one of those things where if someone is going to take a supplement, and that's a whole enough conversation as well, but like if they want to take one, my first thing is, see if you can find one that has this USP seal on it. If it does, and there are no interactions, go crazy and see if it works, right? Um, and so um, that is one huge takeaway. So for yourselves, for family members, for your patients, if they're taking supplements like we probably are, because someone has to be paying into these supplements, make sure that you're getting one with the USP seal. All right, so I want to shift gears here and talk about CBD and, and cannabis and cannabis-related products. And, um, and so um, cannabis is a, a plan of the um, cannabis K family, I probably said that wrong, and contains more than 80 biologically active chemical compounds. And the one that we are most familiar with is um, THC and also now um, CBD as well. THC is the, is the active 
it's the psychoactive component that can help to make you high. Um, and, um, and CBD is like its cousin, which um, does not, is not psychoactive, but it is thought to have um, benefits um, at various um, CBD receptors throughout the body. And so um, the FDA has concluded that these products are excluded from the dietary supplement definition. So they're kind of in this gray area, a little bit of purgatory. And um, I took a picture. This is at my local um, grocery store, so Wegmans. I love Wegmans, if you guys know about Wegmans. Um, but uh, so they have the CBD products there. Um, I'm in Maryland. And they have the CBD products there. And it's under this title, Functional Supplements. And I, it's just, I, I just, what is a functional supplement? <laughs> Seriously, and so it's, it's kind of like we're, we're making up stuff. And again, a, a, a lot of this is marketing. And so like, I think that we need to know when to see that. Um, and so the CBD market again has grown rapidly since 2018. So in, so in 2018, the FDA kind of had opened the door for this saying that hemp and hemp, and hemp related products um, can be sold. And so um, this has, has grown exponentially. And so now it's estimated that the CBD market is worth about $4.6 billion, And I believe it's expected to quadruple within the next four years. Um, like it is ridiculous. And not only CBD, but there's also THC, um, a Delta 8 THC, which is another structurally similar form to a THC, but a little bit different. And so it, it gets through under this like gray area and um, it has also been causing a lot of issues and a lot of trouble. There's also um, Delta 10 um, as well. And so like there are all these uh, different formulations that they're manipulating in the labs and then selling them and marketing them and it's just causing pandemonium. And so um, the FDA um, is aware of this, you know, at least. And they have uh, created a cannabis-derived products data acceleration plan. And so part of the issue here as well is that a large percentage of sales of these products is happening in the e-commerce land and in dispensaries. And it's really hard for the FDA to track and, sur and surveillance this and to follow it. And so um, they are behind. And so what this, um, this packet that they have here um, is there a plan of partnerships and pilot programs to help them to um, try and keep up with the with the um, with the market um, that is outpacing on um, the growth of the science and and our and our understanding as a, um, a public health um, what the implications are of these products so it's, it's kind of moving so fast that the science and and the safety is kind of lagging behind and uh, it's actually kind of scary but they're working on it but it's just this was released last year and we know how fast our government can actually be so hopefully we'll know soon you know um, so, I'll, so I'll put this slide here as a, as a fun fact slide for your pharmacist um, so um, cannabis is metabolized by the liver and so I think that's an important thing to note. This is also important because some of our, um, a lot of our medications are also metabolized by the liver. And so um, if you have, uh, it, it just, it, it can ripen or it can um, make the party interesting for those who may have liver disease or, or be on other medications that can affect the liver and cause a liver damage. And so some people think that Cannabis is natural, so it's harmless. But and we, get, we, we need to look at everything here. Um, so it has a, has a list of drug interactions here. So I'll highlight a few. Um, one, it can interact with, um, with the, the CYP um, P450 enzyme. So as pharmacists, um, this is what we look at for the enzymes that help to break down drugs in, into certain metabolites. Um, and one of the big ones that we look at is, is CYP2C9 um, and CYP3A4. Um, CYP3A4 is one um, that is responsible for breaking down um, Alexacaphthor, Tezacaphthor, and Ivacaphthor. And so it's kind of a big one. Um, and so we need to be aware of that and make sure that we're moni monitoring our patients and their liver function um, for, for, for those who are using these types of products and, and also on medications. Um, that are on this slide, such as these. 
Oh, can also interact with alcohol as well, right? So your alcohol is responsible for um, metabolizing alcohol. And so uh, your liver can only work and do so much. The more that you overwork it, the higher it has to, has to work. And so that's that there. Uh, here are some common side effects with um, cannabis as well. Um, so I will put this here. I do not want to bore you with it per se, um, but just so that uh, my, uh, my point with this slide is to show that it is not necessarily totally harmless um, and that we need to be aware of what some of these side effects are. Then I pulled um, a few studies here. Sorry, it's a little bit tight and compacted, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of, how, it's just kind of how I wrote this afternoon. Um, so the first article here on the far left um, from um, Dr. Murhead and all um, was actually a survey sent to CF centers and was published last summer um, in July. And um, it looked at the, the approach um, to cannabis use assessment, documentation, and, and, and education across CF care centers, and that we're all kind of doing um, different things, which makes sense because it's handled very differently in different states and different areas. Um, and so we're, we're kind of all over the place, and the common theme was that like, we all want more education and resources as care team providers to provide to our patients and guidance. Um, and also of note, I uh, cherry picked as well, that some of the top the clinician advocated indications for the use of cannabis um, for our patients would be for those who have issues with, their, with their appetite, with pain and nausea and anxiety, which makes a lot of sense. Um, then I want to also highlight um, Chang, um, and Chang's article here. And um, this is one that is a slam dunk, right? So it helps us know that marijuana smoking has been associated with chronic bronchitis, which would mean in cystic fibrosis, should not be smoking or inhaling marijuana or um, cannabis products. And that THC also downregulates the expression and function of CFTR. No brainer. So we know that one, like if, if anything, you should not be inhaling cannabis products. Edibles may be a little bit of a different discussion, but in terms of inhaling them, I think it's pretty clear with chronic lung disease, we should not be doing that. Um, and then I want to also highlight um, as well, I talked about, uh, so Ray and colleagues um, have, have just recently published an article, um, it's in a molecular journal, but they looked at 10 different um, Delta-8 THC products and they, um, and they tested them for how they compare based on what they said was actually going to be, what, what they said was um, within the impurities, and they, they all were like wrong and like off dramatically. And so like what they say even on the labels, um, because this is unregulated, it may say it's 10 milligrams of, of CBD or of, of, of Delta 8, but it really may be 100. It really may be 150. And you don't know. Um, and so there were just a lot of impurities in there. Um, and so it's just really risky business there. So now we're, we're playing Russian roulette. Um, when you are talking about these uh, cannabis and CBD products, um, some of the dispensaries and, and these CBD products, even when they say that these have been, they have been independently tested, take that with a grain of salt because that could be just in somebody's random garage. Um, again, this is not, this is not regulated space. Um, and so there's no way to really um, ensure the identity, purity, and strength, and composition of any of those products. Um, so then we're going to move on to essential oils as well. Um, these, um, these also are not really regulated. They may be, they may, they have some regulation of, under the FDA. Um, if they're marketed as a cosmetic or as a drug, but lots of these are not regulated at all. And patients also, they often think that, that these are, um, since they come from plants or they're natural, that they must be safe. Um, but they can, they can contain materials that are toxic, irritating, or likely to, or likely to cause allergic reactions. And so, um, should you nebul nebulize your essential oils? No, 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 no. no. Um, there, there are some, there are some in vitro studies that show that essential oils may inhibit the development 
of certain infections. Um, however, those are in vitro. We need to know what it does in your body. It's also really bad to inhale oil and, and fats into your lungs, which need to be uh, in a water or an aqueous environment. And so you can like have lipoid pneumonia and possibly die. And there's studies of peppermint oil being linked with a pesticide um, exposure and even death, which is really, really sad, but that has also happened. Because some pe people were nebulizing or they have nebulized and put it in their nebulizing machine, these your oils, thinking that, you know, it'll, go to, it'll do that. And it's not, it's actually it's really, really bad. So this was a really easy one, just, just say no. However, <laughs> however, I, this is a little bit separate aromatherapy, like you want to have it like in the room or use it in the room. That's a little bit of a different story. But when we're talking about nebulizing these things, no, 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 no. All right. Um, and so I want to move a little bit fast. I think my time is up, so I want to go fast. Um, so um, it is very important that um, you run through the supplements or supplements with your pharmacist um, because we want to make sure that uh, they are actually safe and, and that they play nicely with your medications and or your health conditions. Um, and so that's another key um, take home point. This is a list of a ton of common herbal supplements that are used. Um, and some of these are really not safe to use with your medications. And so um, I would ask you guys which ones, but you know, we're running late on time. So I'll show you. The ones in red here are um, CYP3A4 inhibitors. So they, they can um, decrease the metabolism of certain medications. And so um, this is a big one, um, especially with like, um, Escaftor, Tezacaftor, and Ivacaftor, um, because those are, those are metabolized by that CYP3 or 4 enzyme. And so if you are on some of these seemingly harmless supplements and you're taking high enough doses of them, you can be harming yourself by, by getting toxic levels of your CF medications because of the supplements that you're taking. And, but the dose does matter. Um, a lot of these, we know that they interact because of in vitro studies, but we don't necessarily know the effect in practice because we don't have a lot of the data. But at least something is better than nothing. And so turmeric is a great example. So I wanted to address um, the um, question from the last session. Um, I had a patient who was on Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, and um, we had we, we, we were checking their enzymes and, and their liver enzymes had shot up. And, um, and I you know, was like, what, what else are you taking? What else are you doing? And I had to like dig deep and, th and they, they shared that they were also doing a turmeric supplement. And it was a pretty hefty dose. And I was like, you know what? I bet you if you stop this turmeric and we recheck your labs in a few weeks or months, we're gonna see a big improvement. And we did. And so, but I also have patients who take turmeric at lower levels or like at much lower doses and they're on a, um, a CFTR modulator and there are no issues. And so you just have to monitor and you have to assess that. We don't know the exact threshold about when it's too high of a dose and when it's not. And so we're still, we're still learning with that. Um, in green here on the slide, St. John's Wort. If you say that to little, literally any pharmacist, <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna cringe, okay? Um, <laughs> Because St. John's wort is a CYP3 or is a CYP inducer. So it's going to make the metabolism speed up for these other drugs and these other medications. And so that's one that we normally say stay away from that. But that one is like, is like nature's SSRI um, for like anxiety and for depression. But it can have a lot of um, issues here. And so I wanted to also highlight um, Indripta, um, which you may have heard or seen in your center. Um, this is one um, that has a lot of these ingredients in there. Um, and it has quite a few CYP3A4 inhibitors and also has an inducer as well. And so this is one that I would at least want to have the conversation with the patients about this medication, see what else they're on, um, and also look at the dose and also monitor their liver function uh, more closely as well. Um, because again, at lower doses, although yes, um, these 
these supplements, they are inhibitors in, um, in vitro. They may not be the same in practice. And so again, my key takeaways, you can and you should recommend the use of USP verified dietary supplements when possible. Um, that our understanding of cannabis products continues to lag beyond the market growth. Discourage the inhale use of these products if you don't hear anything. Um, direct nebulization of essential oils should be strongly discouraged and consult a pharmacist when starting or altering your supplements as they may interact with, uh, with other medications. Sorry for going over, guys. All right, so first, Dr. Grant, we have, um, uh, do, you, do the concerns and interactions also apply to topical CBD? Um, yes, because there is still some level of systemic absorption, um, even with it being topical. So um, that does still have to be considered. However, I would prefer that versus inhaled. Okay. And then can you share anything about elderberry or point a, um, the audience to a good resource? Yes. Um, so elderberry is one of those that is typically used on like a short-term basis. Um, for, for, for most people. Um, and to my knowledge, I don't have it in front of me, so don't entirely hold me by it, but I do not believe that there are any s considerable interactions with common CF meds with, with the elderberry. Thank you. And then uh, are there, is there a specific site that you recommend for an interaction check between modulators and supplements? I do. Um, so it's the Natural Medicines Database. Um, that's my kind of go-to for, for all the natural meds and supplements. Um, again, a, a lot of what's in there is going to still be like in vitro data. Um, unfortunately, there's just not strong, there's not strong evidence, and I didn't talk about that a, a ton, but there's not strong evidence for and like the clinical stuff that we need to really know how safe these supplements are, um, but at least it gives us something, and we something is better than nothing. Does that include essential oils? Uh, yes, it does. I, th I think it does have some essential oils on there as well, um, but not always necessarily like in terms of nebulizing it. But they are on there. <laughs> again. You should not nebulize essential oils. So this question is, do we have data about potential side effects or harms caused by elevated serum levels of Trikafta? Trying to think through having discussions with my patients about THC interactions with the highly effective modulator treatment. Yes. And so um, more so like in that, so, so in regards to that question, I would say that when you have higher levels of, um, of the CF serum modulators in your system, um, you're at a higher risk for the adverse events that are already within like the package insert or, or, or that we're seeing. And so the biggest one and the biggest concern are going to be the elevated liver enzymes. Um, and so once those are, you know, three, three to five times higher than the upper limit, we really have to take an action. Um, but um, a lot of these products as well, and even with the, the CBD um, types of products, our patients use, use them as well. If you monitor them and they're not within those like scarier liver, like the upper l limits of those, I don't have as much of a leg to really stand on. Um, but we don't know, like in terms of chronic use, what this is going to look like in five, ten, twenty years. And there are, uh, uh, at least I know for for me and some of my patients, they are they're concerned about about CFTR modulator use in their own livers without using anything else. Like, and we don't know what's going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years. And so, yeah. Okay. And then does the FDA monitor over-the-counter medications like Tylenol, Ibuprofen, and do manufacturers send their medications to get USP certified, or does USP volunteer evaluate random supplements? Um, so the companies have to submit it to USP. Um, and um, and USP will accept it and go through it. Um, the F the FDA does monitor the same for OTC products as well. Um, they can also be the um, the side effects or like the the complaints can also be reported on the FDA's website. 
Um, but the over over the counter meds are under a little bit of a different category because um, they're going to they are they are going to be regulated um, because they are drugs. Wonderful. So we are beyond time. We definitely have lots of questions, and you all are still sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we can potentially stay if the speakers have time, but I want to thank Dr. Grant and the rest of our speakers for today, and thank you all for joining us.